Good evening. Be with you again with this very special session in our series of salon talks with artists and curators. Today, as we all know, we are with artist Anthony Gormley, who has generously agreed to spend some time with us discussing his broad and fascinating insights about his artwork and about life. Um, before we begin, I want to go through a few technical details. I hope you all received and were able to follow the instructions we sent ahead regarding the online conference platform we're using for this broadcast. Uh, I see that we have uh, uh, over 80 attendees, so I think uh, it's a very good sign that people can, uh, can come in. Uh, in order to allow the high resolution streaming for the recorded session, uh, that we'll show in a few minutes, we chose the new platform. It will not show your personal video input from home, but it allows us to receive questions in chat form, live throughout the meeting and at the Q&A session that will follow. We also have a pleasant surprise. We've arranged a transport of all of us to a Zoom meeting immediately after we finish this session, and we'll be more than happy to see all of you there for an informal discussion. The recordings for the conversation, as well as tonight's live session, are made under challenging technical constraints of the coronavirus crisis. Anthony is in the relative isolation of the English countryside with beautiful pastures and low bandwidth. I am here in the Israel Museum, shut down, and with most of the staff at home. The warmth and diversity of the video quality you're about to see is a visual expression of these times. Now for the main content of the evening. I want to repeat how delighted and honored we are that Anthony Gormley has agreed to join us this evening to talk about his work. And I'd like to thank Tadeusz Ropak, co-chair of our Austrian friends, for making this meeting possible. Thank you very much, Tadeusz. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Anthony Gormley needs very little introduction. He's one of the world's most distinguished and acclaimed artists, who has made a significant contribution to the way we perceive sculpture and the way we've been revisiting the sculpture of the human body. Anthony's works are exhibited truly across the globe, New York, Shanghai, Western Australia, Paris, Florence, London, to name just a few, and Jerusalem, where we are the proud holders of Anthony's lost subject, currently in the Bodyscapes exhibition, curated by our senior curator of modern art, Adina Kamian Kashdan, an exhibition which we hope to see reopening very soon, as soon as the Israel Museum uh, reopens or reopens its doors. Sir Anthony Gormley was, has won numerous awards and has been knighted by Her Majesty the Queen in 2014 for services to the arts. But in my mind, more than anything else, he has touched the hearts, souls, and minds of millions of people around the world. Also significant to Gormley's work is the fact that he began his studies reading archaeology, anthropology, and the history of art, I believe you'll be able to perceive these aspects of his knowledge and curiosity throughout our conversation. Anthony, um, good afternoon, good evening. In a few minutes, we'll hear you mention that you only meet a fraction of 1% of the people who will see your work, but that you feel that you're in conversation with these people, a silent conversation. So I like to think of our dialogue today as the audible extension of a silent conversation one that began many years ago when we first met through my exposure to your artwork. <laughs> I, it would be wonderful if you could say a few words of greeting before we turn to our pre-recorded conversation. Anthony, please. You know, uh, everybody, friends of the uh, Israel Museum, Jerusalem, uh, this is an honor for me and a wonderful example of what can happen when adversity uh, results in new forms arising. Maybe this is a, a kind of uh, example of a mutation that may take us all closer to the idea of a, of a collective mind. And uh, I, I'm just delighted to uh, be part of this conversation. And I hope that after uh, you've seen the film, you will all contribute to uh, yeah, a wider discussion. Um, but I'm delighted to be here, Ido. Uh, thank thank you. you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you so much. So our conversation today will weave around four separate outlooks uh, that we've singled out in Anthony's vast body of work. 
uh, very briefly in words what Anthony calls uh, the darkness of the body or the inner darkness. Uh, the second is looking at us from the outside, so a fresh view of ourselves. Outward towards the world, an invitation to see our environment built and natural in new ways. And maybe what could be, could be called a participatory view, the way we as beholders of Anthony's artwork become part of the artwork itself. So without further delay, I suggest we watch the conversation. I remind you to write your questions in the chat box on the lower right hand side of your screen. And I'm taking the liberty of asking you to send us questions very freely. I've learned to appreciate Anthony's curiosity and interest in receiving real questions from a real audience. Uh, so please enjoy. So hello, Anthony. Uh, thank you so much uh, for um, agreeing to have this uh, dialogue today. Um, I want to begin with um, with this notion of, of, of uh, where we're at, at this moment in time. Uh, you have moved to the countryside in uh, Norfolk, uh, in England. I'm here in Jerusalem. And today we will touch upon four outlooks, four different viewpoints, if you like, uh, regarding your work. Um, the first is uh, a person's view into herself, into himself, uh, what you describe as the inner darkness. And I would like you to please uh, uh, start a conversation relating to that particular um, uh, emotion, uh, observation, and of course, uh, a source of um, energy in your work as a sculptor. Well, um, Ido, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to have this dialogue, this disembodied dialogue, <laughs> using, using the, all the, the, the joys and the frustrations of the digital uh, age that we live in. Um, I think it's good to start with this idea of uh, the darkness of the body. I think this is a, a space that we, we spend most of our lives escaping from. And yet, as a very young child, I was, I, I was uh, yeah, forced to have an afternoon uh, nap. And I would, I would just lie there with my eyes closed and this red light through my eyelids would, would, would in a way, exaggerate that sense of of heat and claustrophobia. And uh, anyway, with this repeated experience, I learned to dwell in that space and to, in a way, experience this transformation. And it went from being this very hot, very claustrophobic kind of tiny box just here to becoming darker cooler and without edges, without definition. And in the end, this was a place that I returned to daily as a child, as this place of, of um, strangely magical freedom. And then when I was in India in the mid 70s, studying Vipassana meditation, I realized that actually this experience of the void, which actually could only be uh, available through being still and quiet and putting the body at rest, was actually, you know, I, I think uh, yeah, in, 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 in terms of uh, Buddhist uh, philosophy, the, the source of everything. This is the void uh, out of which consciousness comes and towards which consciousness is, a, is attracted. Anyway, for me, I think this was, this has become, that, that was a, a, a yeah, foundational experience. And that idea of trying to make sculpture that acknowledged the body as a place rather than as an instrument of action 
and therefore to, uh, in a way, approach the body from the inside, from the, from the point of view of feeling, not from appearance. Uh, this was the, yeah, the, the first step in my, in my kind of realization that I wanted to bring the body back into art. Fantastic. So maybe uh, uh, as another point in the discussion of this um, uh, inner, inner view, I want you to relate uh, uh, to the work that we have in our collection here at the Israel Museum, Lost Subject. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it, it's necessary perhaps to now paint the picture of um, the context in which I grew up as a young artist. We were highly influenced by, and, and I I'm still I have a huge admiration for American sculpture of the, of the late 60s and, and the early 70s. And, and in, in a way, the, the dominance there on process, on material, and on object. But nevertheless, there was a sense in which the, the, the body was acknowledged by those works, uh, but not referenced. And I, I made Lost Subject very consciously in relation to Duchamp's found object, or uh, re ready-made, with the idea that, that maybe in this progress of the 20th century's isms, uh, from cubism through to conceptualism, in, in, in some senses a, an aspect of art had been lost, which was, I think, about affect, about feeling. And I, I lost subject remains for me, in, in a way, a, yeah, a, a key work. It's almost a testimonial to an ambition to allow art again to carry feeling or be the site of feeling. And, and, and this is very important to me. I'm not interested in illustrating emotion. I am interested in creating a place in which emotion can arise through the projected uh, impressions of the viewer. So the lost subject could refer to the work, but it could also refer to whoever is looking at the work. And then I want that to be an open question. You know, what arises in what you were talking about earlier, the, the, the shared connection that we have with what we call art, which is a kind of bridge between people, maybe a, a objective correlative of uh, our uh, yeah, need to make contact, but, but somehow separated from the contact itself. I mean, sculpture is an extraordinary art insofar as I will maybe only meet a very small percent of 1% of the people who maybe come across my work. And yet I still feel that it is a kind of conversation, but it's a silent one. And I think it, it remains now our duty as living artists to continue in a way by giving back the freedom that art took for itself to discover a whole range of formal possibilities back to the, to the viewer and say, can we make the arena of art an open place in which we examine what it means to be, to be alive, to be conscious, to be, in a way, a life form amongst other life forms? I think we'll return to the, to the question of how uh, uh, beholders or uh, observers uh, become participants. For now, I want to discuss a little bit moving from looking inside to looking at us 
in a new way, the way that some of your work suggests to us to see, uh, not to look inside, but to look at the human figure, which is, of course, also some sort of mirror of ourselves, in a new way. And I want you to relate specifically uh, to the work done in domain fields, which I find particularly powerful in that sense. You even described it as if you are uh, sculpting our nervous system, uh, what we see, which is just under our skin. Yeah, this, this idea of, uh, in a way, art as a, as a form of, of skepsis or a, an instrument for skepsis has been there right from the very beginning insofar as the lead skin of lost uh, subject or any of the early lead works is simply saying well actually this is an insulator you might say you might say yes this is uh, this is a definition of the edge of something but at the same time it's saying actually this is a hiding so there's a, the insulation is not about revelation as much as uh, actually just saying, well, maybe appearance is not reality. And the empty, you know, lost subject, one of the principal materials when you read on the label, uh, its title is air. And it's very important to me that you recognize that this is a box that is empty, that happens to be in human form. So the idea is really to, to, to be able to imaginatively transcend this barrier of the insulating skin of appearance and think about this interior. And, and I guess when you go on to the domains, at some, at some point in the trajectory of my work, yeah, I decided to abandon this obsession with the edge or uh, renegotiating the, the, the liminal edge of appearance and just say, no, well, a body is a temporary aggregation of, uh, of uh, mass and energy. So can we, can we somehow capture the bounding condition and then begin to describe in a way, another system of trajectories within it. And Domain Field was maybe yeah, one of these early works where uh, I yeah, wanted to make a, a, a field system that in, encapsulated the memory of multiple human existences, but at the same time was a kind of um, yeah, proprioceptive device. So the, the, the viewer has to be very conscious of their own movement through space-time as they negotiate through this field of quite yeah, dangerous and spiky uh, sculptures. You know, this, this potential of art to become a reflexive instrument I think at a certain point, I, I wanted to move from these early works that use the indexical register of a captured moment of lived human time and the mold of the body and go into something a way much, much truer to what we now understand uh, the nature of physical reality to be, which is the temporary aggregation uh, of, uh, yeah, uh, trajectories of, of energy and uh, the lovely thing about the main field I think was the way that uh, these so this was nearly 300 people some children some uh, yeah, young adults some older people as you say the expansion fields to breathing room to blind light all of those, you could say, pieces that take the idiom of architecture as the reference point. So the, I, I think of, of, of architecture really as the second body. We, we, 
we have a life it's contained within the skin but then we 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 insulate the skin with clothing but we protect it further by by making these second skins of the walls and floors and ceilings of our habitat and i i've moved consistently from as it were the first condition of embodiment to the second condition of you could say uh the 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 making of shelter that that constitutes architecture and played between the two and that's what that's what uh yeah expansion field is it's 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 talking about the place of individual life as also a kind of space station uh, uh, with the ability of infinite expansion. I want to move on to a third aspect or a third outlook of your work, which is the, the, uh, the type of work that um, allows us a, a recess in time and says, wait a minute, take, take a minute, take a, f a few minutes and uh, look around you and perceive your environment in a slightly new way. And I chose two of your works that I find do that in a very beautiful way. One of them is maybe your most modest work, which is that beautiful witness chair uh, in the piazza of the, of the library, the British Library in London. Um, and uh, maybe we'll begin with that and then move on uh, uh, to another work. So maybe you want to, to relate to that, that, that uh, action of, of uh, offering us um, uh, a, a stop in time and then a, a, a new view of our environment, whether it's built or natural. Yeah, thank you. That's a, I'm really glad that you, you know about that work. Um, I'd like to think that art itself is uh, a place in the world, but not of it that allows us in a way to be released from this sense of work and obligation and that re refounds us in other words gives us a foundation from which we can look in a in a, in a sense outside of time we live in such a causal and instrumental way that somehow we think that only action that has a result is valuable and i think sculpture is such an important thing in a digital time where mass communication at very very high speed uh, affords us imagery that changes uh, in nanoseconds. Sculpture is a relatively still thing in a moving world that is, seems to be moving, you know, apart from this time now, this precious time of, in a way, isolation, but also of having time. Uh, yeah. The, the world, once it cranks up again, I hope it won't be quite so manic as before. Um, but sculpture, for me, is, offers this place of stillness and silence from which we can look both inside our own experience and out at the world that surrounds us and the witness chair was was uh, paid for by Penn uh, yeah the, the the amazing organization that protects the freedom of speech and the right of uh, yeah sensitive individuals to publish their perceptions of a wider world and I thought the, the, the most important thing is um, somehow just to manage to make a work that allows the individual to sit in this piazza in the front of 
the British Library, a place where, in a way, the, the printed thought of the history of our species is yeah, on nine levels of basements, uh, concentrated, underground. And, uh, and look back out at the piazza, hear the noise of the traffic of Euston Road, be aware of the condition of light, and just take a moment, in a way, out of this world of action and doing and obligation. And I, I guess that, you know, that, that's an example of what I would like to think that all of my work offers uh, a, a place, a place to think. Yeah. Um, now, from, from that perspective, how would, you, uh, how would you describe the similarities and differences between the witness chair and event horizon, which is in some ways to me seems like looking at, at something very similar, but of course expanding in this, uh, in this uh, um, how do they say, me me metropolitan scale. Um, uh, into into the big cities, yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, event horizon. I I always uh, yeah characterize as a, a kind of acupuncture of collective space. So you know, the work is derived from uh, twenty three um, individual um, moldings of 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 my body then made into iron and fiberglass. I think of them as, as yeah, they're, they're industrially made fossils of a, of, a, of a particular example of a particular species of life form. And then I put the four iron ones on the ground and I put 27 on the skyline, on, on what for city dwellers becomes the replacement of a horizon. That bit where the built world stops and infinite space starts. And the interface between the two is simply asking and, 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 and what, what is this uh, human life form? And where, where, where do we belong? Uh, I, I think that the, the Tibetan Buddhists have a wonderful way of talking about nakedness as sky clad. And this is, you know, for me, this is, well, this is not about the nude. It's not, you know, the, the nude in, 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 you know, Western art anyway, has been in a way a, yeah, a subject of the male gaze, uh, a kind of idealization of the erotic. Um, and I'm not interested in that at all, but I am interested in bare life and asking what is a life. And I suppose, yeah, for, for me, this uh, interface between the bodies that you bump into on the, on the sidewalk, I'm thinking now particularly of the installation in New York, and then the sight of this naked, vulnerable, human-scale uh, object in relation to the sky or space at large, and then in relation to the world that we have made out of an elemental earth. The question of scale and the question of size, which are two very different things, uh, is not something that I feel that I have much choice about. Um, all the event horizon simply uses human scale. I mean, this was, this is, as it were, the subject turned into an object, which is then littered like confetti around a city. And, uh, and the, the issue for me then is that this, this human scale that is not like most of the monumental sculpture that we know from history, but what it means is it puts our scale into space-time reference. And this for me, so the relative position of the moving viewer 
in this field of fixed objects, some of which are, as it were, at the artificial uh, horizon of the skyline, and some of which are on the ground right next to you, uh, into a, a kind of relational uh, field of tension. And, and I think that this, um, the, use, the use of scale or a relative size in relation to a moving viewer, this has been part of the most exciting potential of sculpture for me, to set up fields in which um, you know, the possible perception of a distant object then becomes realized. So, so something like another place, which is a similar idea of multiple body forms uh, placed within an environment now, is not the city, but it's a, the meeting of land, sea and air, uh, but it's a vast field in which we have a, a, a depth of, of, of about a kilometer and a length of about three and a half kilometers, uh, added to the idea of yeah, the time of the tides as opposed to, to, to uh, clock time. And you, you, I mean, it's, it's simply a way, this is, a, this is a work that simply provides you with a, with a um, you could say, a relational uh, grid uh, or a relational mean by which you sense your own position in space-time. And I'd like to think that, yeah, a lot of the multiple uh, works have that same ambition to create literally a, a, a kind of uh, test site for our uh, sense of our own being in space and, and time. Okay, so the, the, the fourth outlook I want to discuss today, uh, the beholders becoming part of the artwork. This is, um, I think, a, a part of the works you've been doing. I'll mention a number of, of examples, especially Passage at the Uffizi uh, Cave at the Royal Academy, and uh, the beautiful work in the Tadeusz Ropak Gallery that uh, opened just uh, as the corona crisis uh, uh, began and, and immediately uh, closed this line, beautiful line in space. And the other, uh, of course, it's called Run 2. And, and uh, um, the, the, the second thing that happens there, it's not only that we become participants, observers, you know, moving, sort of pulsating between these two positions, but also it is testing our habits, our perceptions. I, I think that I, I've become more and more interested in, as it were, yeah, substituting uh, m my body as an example uh, of a common, uh, yeah, the common condition of embodiment to wanting to make objects that in a way invite the physical entrance of the body of the viewer, where the, the, the body of the viewer becomes the figure in the ground. And uh, I think, you know, Actually, it was blind light that maybe made that the most uh, obvious, where inside this glass box, uh, in a, a, yeah, double the atmospheric pressure, was a very, very dense cloud of luminous uh, water vapor that for the people outside the box, uh, you would see, as it were, bodies appearing and disappearing into this physical zone of light. And for the, the, the viewer who goes in through this permanently open threshold, they experience the loss of a sense of uh, objective self. So even if you have your hand in front of you, uh, you can't see it. And so what that means is that you are immersed in, in as it were, 
consciousness without, without reference to the body at all. And I, I guess passage for me was a way of making the opposite of blind light, making a, a work that was equally acoustically important. So in, in, in blind light, you were intensely aware of the movement of other bodies, the, the, the sound of uh, feet moving against the wet floor and people giggling and, 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 and breathing all around you. In passage, and that, all of that being in, in, in very, very bright light, 2,700 lux of, of light. In passage, you enter an object that you know from the outside because you've walked around it. This is a 12 meter long uh, passage uh, in a very simplified human silhouette. But the minute you pass the threshold, you're walking into darkness. You're walking into your own shadow. And the acoustics are, are amplified by, the, by, by this um, six, seven millimeter of Corten steel that actually doesn't touch the ground. So it's, it's all extremely sensitive to the vibration of your footfall. And you're moving in a way into the dark. And I think that, uh, yeah, passage in, in, in some respects is a, yeah, again, a kind of metaphor for the journey that we're all on towards the dead end, uh, towards the dark. But the, the, the <laughs> in a way, the, the metaphysical becomes physical in that work when you either, as I have done several times in that work, you actually hit that end wall um, and you turn around and you see the light at the end of the tunnel and return to the, to the world. It's interesting that the, you could say that I'm constantly trying to find uh, ways of both containing and at the same time liberating uh, us from uh, our preconceptions and our unconscious manipulation by the environments that we live within. Um, I don't know who, who came up with this phrase, but, but you know, we make a world and then the world makes us. We make a habitat and the habitat begins to enforce habits and modes of connection, of living, of, of, of thinking and, and, and communicating that maybe we don't, we are not conscious of. And I guess that, you know, to go from passage to, uh, to run to, I talked about acupuncture in terms of event horizon, in terms of trying to make a kind of acupuncture points for a whole city. I think that run two attempts to do acupuncture points for the built world, for, for you know, try, trying to use the space, the enclosed space of a gallery as a, a kind of uh, test case for the way in which our environment uh, affects us and gives us choices and on the one hand uh, gives us uh, yeah, a certain freedom of movement but also exercises control. And I think then you asked about, about cave and cave deliberately you could say stands in between passage and, and, uh, and run to here is within certainly the way that it was uh, shown first and the space that it was made in, which was Gallery 8 of the Royal Academy, a very ornate grand room uh, in kind of Renaissance European uh, style. I wanted to bring the language of modernity, so 
a highly orthogonal cubic uh, yeah, volumes, but disrupt them. The dialogue between, as it were, the grandeur of, of uh, yeah, palace architecture, in which the human, again, in terms of scale, is, 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 is invited to feel great and important and powerful. And for me, this, I call this work Cave because I wanted to reconcile, as it were, the, our idea of the primary shelter, which is, I think, part of our limbic system, part of our, in a, in a way, our, our, the, the formation of our fundamental relationship to enclosed space, which is also related to, to our experience of, of the birth canal and of, I guess, our, our, the, the first passage that we, that we come into the world through. Anyway, from this very tight enclosure, which is actually the left foot of a lying body form that you can't ever really see in total because it's been squeezed into this, well, relatively large room because it's uh, yeah, nine meters wide by 12 meters long. But you, you end up going down the left, the left leg and then you enter this very large space which is really the torso uh, and pelvic area of the body and can look up uh, towards the light um, that comes from the, from the head and down one knee. I wanted cave to be the, the, the precursor of this then experience of host, the bringing in of the outside, 50,000 liters of, of, of the Atlantic brought you know, onto the first floor of Piccadilly, um, uh, remove, removed all of the lights, mixed that seawater with uh, 25 tons of, of uh, Buckinghamshire clay. And here was, in a way, this primal relationship between the viewer as subject and and the elements that support us. Unfortunately, we have to, uh, this dialogue has to come to, to an end. But I want to read to you something that you said to me about one of your works. But I think it's, it, it's possibly it's relevant to all of your work and maybe to all of, our, our, uh, of, of what we do in the world. I'll read it, I'll read it to you. Uh, it is a meditation on the fact that mortal life, for us humans, is an experience of constructed time and that we carry death within us and that death may not be the end of everything. I am neither, neither an atheist nor a theist. We have this limited time on earth. It's a workshop time. And I, when, when you said that to me, this notion of our life being a workshop time. Uh, your life as an artist, uh, everyone's life as, as a human being, being a workshop time and the meaning of what it means to, to be on workshop, of, of a workshop and workshop time, I think is something that we can carry with us for, uh, uh, for a long time. Uh, maybe you want to say something about that and uh, with that I think we can uh, and this part of our talk. We are moving towards a state of 10 billion of our species. We, we, we have, we've used uh, in a way the material memory of the 3.7 billion years of our planet's photosynthesis. We are at a real threshold in, in terms of whether human consciousness can find a way of contributing to the evolution of life on this planet without destroying it. 
this represents maybe culturally the biggest challenge that you know E.O. Wilson says it so well you know we have Paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions and the godlike ability uh, of uh, creation and destruction. Well, I want to reinforce the notion that that art is a common territory. It has been with our species right from the very beginning. I mean, you know, the Bekat Ram uh, figure that we found uh, in Israel represents you know, the beginning of this questioning of what it means to, to be embodied. Now, you know, if, if we believe the date of this, unbelievable, you know, two, 200 millennia um, before present time, uh, you know, we are now at a at a place in terms of the evolution of life on this planet, where we have a, we have a critical, uh, in a way, decision to make about how consciousness will evolve and whether we can live sustainably. I believe that art is absolutely central to that transition or uh, answering that challenge. The commodification of art in our time uh, has maybe obscured its better self, which is that it is the thing that connects us and allows us, I think, to be, yeah, well, <laughs> art is, is, is intrinsic to our being human. And I believe that in a time of the failure of politics and in, in, in a sense the, the, um, our understanding of the consolations of religion being limited, art is an absolutely critical instrument to us understanding each of our responsibilities for the collective life of this planet. And we have to use it wisely and we can't allow it to become commodified and institutionalized. So, welcome back. Uh, We're now taking questions from the audience. Uh, we've received a few questions and remarks during the screening. I'd like to read them uh, for Anthony's response. Uh, response. I'll begin uh, with uh, Hannah Arnon, who wrote that uh, it's fascinating, something to think about for a long time. I, of course, totally agree. And I want to read uh, Michal Shabtai's, uh, uh, Michel Shabtai's, sorry, Michel Shabtai's question. Has the pandemic and its rippling, <clears throat> sorry, rippling ramifications inspired you in an artistic way? If so, how? Anthony, please. Thing for the for the camera. Hello, can yeah. you hear me? Ah, we hear you. We hear ah, you. good, good, good. Sorry, remind me of the question again. Uh, has the pandemic and its rippling ramifications inspired you in an artistic way? If so, hi, how? This is a question by Michel Shabtai. Yeah, I don't know. I, you know, in a way, this is uh, this is the world that artists and poets, I guess, live in all the time. I mean, we, we, we are not, we are not obliged to, um, you know, turn up at nine o'clock. Um, uh, we make up our own, uh, yeah, time and, 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 uh, uh, projects. And for me, it's been, I think, just really inspiring to see how somehow, uh, in spite of our distance, what it's meant is that households have had to reconnect with domestic life in a way that, yeah, television and 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 in a way social media have have denied. And I think even simple things like cooking or yeah, cleaning the house 
have sort of become ritual. I mean, I, I have never seen uh, spring arise. I have never been aware of, as it were, daily life repeating itself so uh, simply because I am in one place for a protracted time. And I guess, yeah, what, 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 what it's meant is that I can spend more time you know, drawing. So I, I, you know, I've been, I've, I've been doing a lot of, lot of, uh, <laughs> just thinking about sculpture and 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 doing little notations. And then, yeah, if I just show you, you know, making, yeah, making models. Um, and yeah, I guess for me, what this isolation time has done is given us a new appreciation of time and being able to take time and i think that's a lesson i think that we have to use this time in a way not to return to the grinding world of late capitalism and uh, and and all its obligations thank you anthony we have two questions uh, one from ronald katz and one from carol simmons regarding your sculptures on the island of Delos. Uh, uh, one is just a, a request for a comment, but Carol is asking, where have they gone to? <laughs> um, they, they, they all came back. Uh, they all came back at the, uh, at the end of last year. And some of them came back having been absolutely transformed by having spent yeah, five months no longer. They were there about seven months and in in the Aegean uh, and they 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 just came back with the most incredible patina um, but yeah some of them so, some of them um, were loaned uh, because they'd been uh, consigned to galleries so they went to galleries and now have gone to permanent homes um, uh, some of them I, I I've kept for myself so a work like bearing uh, is uh, yeah now um, I live with that um, but uh, yeah, that was a that that was an incredible incredible honor to uh, occupy that sacred site, the birthplace of Apollo, and and in 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 a way do a similar form of acupuncture or or just sensing where a particular work might work uh, within the the ruins of that amazing city. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. We have, uh, we have another question from Esther Young. Uh, uh, Esther is asking about your skills. With the varying scale of your work, how much of the actual fabrication have you participated in over the years? Do you have a background in metal fabrication? <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it, I, I've, I've made it up as I gone along. I mean, I started using lead because it was something that, where I could do everything. So I was, uh, yeah, I was the model. I, 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 I uh, my, my wife molded me, but from that point onwards, I made the, I made the mold. I, I, I strengthened it with fiberglass. I beat the lead. After doing that for about um, twenty years, I ended up, yeah, with quite a lot of lead inside my bloodstream, and I had to give that, I had to give that up. Um, and uh, then I started moving towards using this concentrated earth material iron. And uh, to the point now where, where actually, um, you know, look, I, I will be going in 10 days time up to um, the studio that I have near to Newcastle, uh, where we have a whole foundry. And um, we've learned that as we've gone along as well. But it, that, that's, that's a fantastic, uh, well, wonderful um, learning process. I don't know if any of you read Marcia Eliade's uh, Forge and the Crucible, but um, there's something absolutely alchemical and magical about the transformation of, of uh, yeah, uh, ore into liquid light is what it becomes. Um, and uh, yeah, every 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 month uh, we we cast one or two sculptures up there um, after 
having made them out of the you know the most lightweight material so yeah you can see behind me but also there i mean that's made that that's made of uh, polystyrene um you know it weighs nothing and then in in 53 seconds usually it's usually under a minute it takes to transform something that is nothing into uh, something that will last a thousand years. Wow. So we, we have two more uh, uh, metal questions. Uh, a beautiful question from Adina Kamian. Adina Kamian, as I mentioned, is our senior curator of modern art, her, whose exhibition Bodyscapes actually okay. uh, has a lost subject in it, uh, sleeping uh, under a Tyvek uh, cover waiting for the reopening of the museum. Nadina is asking, uh, uh, she's saying, thank you for sharing the ideas behind your art so generously. And she's asking, is the dual nature of lead protective and poisonous meaningful to you? Yeah, absolutely. I think that lead, you know, lead in our chemical sense is sort of uh, the prima materia uh, in this idea of sublimation and transformation. And I like the, the fact that yes, it's it, it, it's an insulator. It's a it's a um, you know it's it's capable of protecting whatever lies within it uh, from from radiation, from harmful nuclear radiation. And certainly in the in the beginning of my use of it, I was thinking of it very much in this hermetic sense that I was making these either pierced or completely closed uh, forms. So. Lost subject is a completely closed form that contains, as it were, the absent, empty space of a human space in space at large. Um, but with the idea that that was somehow, uh, yeah, protected, and it wasn't. It wasn't obviously functional, but the idea that that protected space could be imaginatively ha inhabited, and in a sense also be the site of a form of transformation in which matter becomes feeling or thought. Okay, That's very beautiful. Uh, Doron von, von Beider uh, says, thank you for the talk. Your work is, fascina is a fascinating relationship with the built environment. Could you name two of the architects that influenced your work, if any? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess, the, you know, the architect of the Pantheon, I, 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 I don't think he had a name. So um, <laughs> the Emperor uh, Hadrian, um, yeah, uh, kind of uh, commissioned that building, uh, or maybe he only made the portico, but, you know, that's a, an incredible space for me that, that uh, as it were, internalizes uh, a sense of, yeah. You know, the celestial, uh, but within the relations of, of human body. And then I guess, you know, the architect that, that has somehow listened to the primal forms of architecture is somebody like Louis Kahn, uh, who still for me r represents, you know, the very best of modernism, where in a sense you start again. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting in a, in, a, in a building made by David Chipperfield, I, I've, I've worked with him. He built my studio in London. Uh, I think that he's an inheritor also of a, of a sense of space, mass, and light that he shares with Louis Kahn and also with the, with the Pantheon. There's a, there's a sense of uh, architecture belonging to the ground, to being, being, as it were, connected, rooted to the ground. Uh, that that his work uh, carries. You know, there was a time, you know, I guess in early modernism with Corbusier's Pilotti that everything had to leave the ground. And actually, I think that good architecture, in fact, relinks you with the ground. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So maybe one more question. Um, Mr. Davide Blay, who is the president of our Italian friends, is asking Mr. Gormley, do you follow the Feuerbach philosophy? Uh, you have to tell me what the Feuerbach. I, I, I'm, I'm aware of the, of the, of the man, um, but I, I'm afraid he, he has to explain. 
Okay, well, maybe you will write to us. Uh, okay, I think I think um, I think we're we're near the closing of this of this evening. We'll see if Davide writes us a little more a little bit more in a second. I want to thank uh, the team who managed the production under the constraints of time and technology, and they were quite heavy. Uh, there are too many names to mention individually, but I wanted to to uh, say two very special thank yous. One to our acting. Chief Curator of Fine Arts, Sylvia Rosenberg, for her precise, uh, uh, precise work and, and devotion, which was really exceptional. And Rachel Shaul, Director of International Relations, who guided this complex production to the shores of safety. Uh, thank you very much. And of course, I want to thank Anthony, uh, Anthony with all my heart. Uh, this is not, uh, not trivial. Uh, I really appreciate the time and the patience and going through all the uh, various uh, technical issues that we had to go through. And I hope that everyone enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Uh, in a few seconds, everyone will see on the screen a button, which uh, if you push it, it will, will transport you uh, into a Zoom meeting where we can all see each other uh, and talk. I think we have to uh, allow Anthony to have his uh, supper, which he hasn't had yet. And thank so we'll, we'll what say, about your supper, for heaven's sakes? <laughs> <laughs> we'll say a big, big thank you. And uh, we hope to see you again next time live, physically live, in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. Uh, and um, we'll, we'll find the right uh, opportunity and a very good excuse to bring you over and enjoy uh, this type of discussion, this time in a more cozy and, and physical uh, environment. Yeah, I have to say that was very uncomfortable for me. It felt so slow and so um, well. We were we were very distant digitally and everywhere else. And I really look forward uh, and every form else. I really look forward to uh, to being with you in the flesh. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, you Ida. Thank okay. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>